Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so today we're extremely happy to have Jeanette Dickinson visiting us from Fermina. Um, so as we learned during the lunch, um, she did her PhD at Berkeley, where she worked on the production of the Higgs in association with um, the top fork and anti-top fork. Um, and so during her postdoc, she's continued to work on um, Higgs physics and has really been um, a pioneer in applying jet subject techniques to better understand the Higgs. And I think she'll tell us a bit about that um, today. So go for it. Thank you guys for having me. It was nice to get to know you a little bit. Um, thank you, Isaac and Ian, for uh, making this visit happen. I'm happy to be here. So uh, I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about uh, boosted Higgs boson production via the cool boson fusion. Uh, Jindy uses a whole bunch of jet, jet substructure techniques for identifying the Higgs boson, uh, but the fundamental measurement of which is uh, a Higgs measurement, not a QCD one. So, Building that we were talking about, the high rise you can see here in the paper. So you can decide whether it's beautiful or not. <laughs> okay, so I just have a little bit of background on the Large Hadron Collider, which I'm sure you've all heard of, uh, but it flies protons and heavy ions. Uh, it's, but I'm only going to be talking about the, the proton part. Um, so you can see down here a diagram of what this looks like underground. Uh, this sort of straddles the uh, Swiss French border. That looks to be very easy to access from the city. You can see it must be very difficult. Um, and it's the highest pollution energies ever reached in a man made facility. Um, and so far, the LHC has produced 10 to the 16 proton proton collisions, which is a lot. Uh, and by the end of data taking in 2040, after the high luminosity LHC, uh, we're going to increase that by about a factor of 20. So I always like to say that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again. You can definitely the doing at the LHC, but expecting a different result. But the wonderful thing is that uh, quantum mechanics is insane in exactly this way. So we do actually produce a whole bunch of different things in our uh, duplicate initial state. Uh, so this is the uh, standard model of particle physics. These are all we can make. Uh, we make all of these particles at the LHC, although we don't necessarily measure them all. And the Higgs boson is the most recently discovered constituent. It was proposed in actually only the 60s and discovered in 2012. At the large hydro collider, you can see here a picture of the uh, big talk slash party where uh, the announcement was made. And so far, all the properties of this uh, most newly discovered particle match the predictions. Uh, but in my opinion, this uh, new particle is the most likely way that we're going to find undiscovered physics at the LHC. So uh, this is a list of the recipes for making a Higgs boson and proton proton collisions. Um, you have to initiate the Higgs production with proton constituents, so it includes gluons and quarks. Um, and you have four different main production modes here. These are the ones with uh, the highest probability of happening at the LHC. So here we have gluon fusion, where you have two gluons coming in, and then you have a quark loop, um, where Higgs is radiated on the loop. Uh, you have vector boson fusion, where you have two quarks coming in. Each one radiates a W or a Z boson, which leads to form the Higgs. Um, we have what we call VH, or vector both have associated production, where you just basically produce a W or a Z in a fairly ordinary way, and it radiates a Higgs. Um, and then finally, you have TTH production, which is a lot like gluon fusion, except instead of having a loop, you actually produce uh, these two top quarks. You can kind of think about snipping this loop and sending the top quarks actually into a final state. Um, so each of these, you can see, have different final state topologies. In addition to the Higgs boson, there's like other stuff that's produced in these different events. Is how we can tell them apart. Um, we also have sensitivity to different couplings of the Higgs boson, so I've actually color coded them here. Um, this little blue circle indicates the interaction between the Higgs boson and a on. So in this case, blue infusion, it's mostly the top part, but other parts uh, also dissipate. And over there in TTH, you can see it's the same uh, coupling to the top part. Uh, and in the case of vector boson fusion and VH, um, this is the interaction between the Higgs boson and a vector boson. So um, we have all these different ways of producing the Higgs. We have all these different additional stuff that's produced with the Higgs. And for each of these different things, we're probing a slightly different interaction. So um, this is a very familiar plot to anybody who works on Atlas of CNS. This is uh, the cross section of Higgs production as a function of center of mass energy. So right now we're sitting mm -hmm. right here. Actually, we're sitting close to the 14 TeV if we're talking about round three, but this is a data set on 13 TeV. Uh, data. So um, this little word cloud here shows you the relative cross section 
of each of these different contributing processes to the total heat cross section. So this blue line here is representing gluon fusion. So that's the biggest, uh, which is put in the word cloud. Then we have vector boson fusion. And then we have the WH and the ZH in these two green colors. And then TTH in this purple. Um, and then we actually have single top phase production in this other purple that I'm not going to talk about at all today. Um, and we usually say that gluon fusion accounts for 90% of the base boson cross section at 13 TeV. It's sitting way up at the top. And if you do a measurement of this and you do it without your glasses on, um, you can very easily say, ah, this is mostly broken. I'm just going to say that it's all going fusion. I'm going to move. Um, but if we talk about uh, actually measuring things at high PT, this is no longer true. So um, this 90% of the heat flow cross section uh, coming from by global fusion is only true if you measure inclusively in the transverse component of the Higgs boson. So if you start applying a minimum threshold on the transverse component of the Higgs, um, you get a very different picture. So this is actually showing you as a function of the minimum PT of the Higgs, uh, the fractional contribution to the total cross section. And you can see that um, this is really irritating. So reverse between this plot and this one, uh, but one fusion is green. And you can see it's like taking a nosedive as you go to high momentum. Uh, VH, which is the blue here, is increasing in the count a lot. And vector boson fusion is pretty consistently just 20% of the total there. Uh, but I've drawn this little vertical line to show you that if you look at PT above 800 GeV, this is the makeup of um, the total mixed cross section in terms of all of these different uh, things. So these are actually on a much more even playing field now. And uh, you can't really get away with pretending that it's all going fusion anymore. So, um, what I'm going to be talking about today is vector boson fusion at high PT. So vector boson fusion is uh, this diagram, or uh, this process that's sitting very comfortably at 20% regardless of the minimum PT. Um, and you might ask, why are we interested in this high PT? So um, the main reason is that high PT tails are sensitive to new physics of high energy scales. Um, and I'm not actually going to show a an effective field theory interpretation today, but I just want to give you guys a little bit of motivation for why we want to do this. Um, so the different production modes of the Higgs are probing different beyond the standard model operators, but we can start to see their effects if we look high enough in energy. So this is kind of a cartoon that we can use um, when we're talking about effective field theory. You can imagine that you have some energy-like variable like the Higgs boson, uh, and you have a standard model prediction for that. The event probability is going to fall with that energy. Um, you can imagine that if your collider can reach an energy something like this. Uh, you might have something that is at a much higher energy that actually gives you some structure in this distribution. Um, and the idea is that even if your collider is much lower energy than this, you can start to see a small difference between the standard model and beyond the standard model um, in this distribution of this energy variable. And this is more pronounced as we look at higher energies, which is why we want to push out to the high P details of this case boson distribution. And since we've done this before, um, for fluid fusion, we'd like to do this for uh, a different production mode that is probing, probing a different Higgs interaction because you can start to see this um, effect from a Higgs to vector boson interaction rather than a Higgs to fermion interaction. So, the eventual goal um, of this whole program is a Higgs effective field theory interpretation. Um, basically, the way that we describe that mathematically is by saying let's assume that our total Lagrangian is a standard model Lagrangian plus a bunch of different pieces uh, made up of all of the different higher order operators that I can think of that obey reasonable symmetries. Um, and there should not be a whole bunch of them. This is uh, something like 2,500. Um, and then we can do a bit and see, oh, do we see any deviations from the expectation, which is well for any of these higher order operators. So you can see over here for a couple of different example operators in the BBF Higgs process, this is the Higgs boson PT. The blue here is representing um, the range that the measurement we're going to talk about today can actually probe. Um, and you'll see the standard model is this black distribution. And then you can see there are a whole bunch of enhancements for all these different from the standard model um, scenarios that correspond to non zero coefficients for these higher dimensional operators. So um, this is you know, a place where we could potentially see an enhancement that corresponds to some new physics. Does this new physics have oh, one? It's okay. Uh, I just had a quick question. How can you, okay, how can you distinguish one mechanism from the other in your um, actual measurement? Um, do you mean one mechanism? Like yeah, so one like, of these operators or something? Uh, so if you go back, 
Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, too much. Yeah, that, uh -huh. yeah. Well, I guess you would see the quarks or yes. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So um, in this, in the measurement that I'm going to talk uh, about, I'm not looking for these two. Um, so ignore uh -huh. them for now. Um, I'm actually going to look for these two additional quarks okay. that respond to two additional jets, and they also have some like very characteristic kinematics and angular uh -huh. properties. Um, so I'll talk about that in a little bit. Yeah. You said that new physics, the added operators would give you enhancements. Is there any physics that would give you a deficit, a, a negative? Uh, um, so when I have generated these types of samples, I have seen that only in the, I have seen that that is mathematically possible, um, but not in regions of parameter space that make any sense. Um, so. Um, Basically, in places where you have the Higgs quark interaction turned up so high that it it's like very far outside of what already exists. So, in principle, yes. Um, and because there are so many of these, you can tune them with each other and against each other, and you could probably achieve that. But it's very easy to get uh, an enhancement, and I think it's harder to get a deficit. Did you arrive at the 2,199 or 2,500? I did not do that. Oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, this is very much from theorist colleagues who do effective field theory. Um, and this also relies on some assumptions. So you, you know, build in things like, I assume that um, the first and second generation flavor structure is the same and um, stuff like that. So um, this number is probably a 200 of the bigger. Um, but it actually has been all published. This is this is well known, and there's a basis that exists out to dimension six here. And actually, one thing that I can point out is that um, at the uh, PCAP meeting yesterday, we were talking about the future of particle physics. One of the six science drivers is quantum imprints, um, and this is exactly the type of effect that they're referring to when they say quantum imprints. It's um, you know not an overt discovery of something new, so not an observation of this peak, but an observation of this kind of um, discrepancy due to quantum effects at higher uh, energy scales that we can access in our experiments. Okay, so um, I talked a little bit about how to make a Higgs boson, now we have to talk about how to detect it. So the Higgs boson has a very short lifetime. So in our detector, we identify it by its decay products and their reconstructed mass. Um, and the most probable decay channel for a Higgs boson is to a pair of bottom quarks. So you can see a pie chart over here that's showing you the different ways that this pair model Higgs boson can decay. Um, and more than half of the pie, this blue part over here is the Higgs decay to a bottom and bottom quark pair. And you can see that this red piece, the next one is Higgs to WW. Um, but historically, when we've made measurements of the Higgs boson, the most precise and most sensitive ones have come from the Higgs to deck photon decay. And the Higgs to ZZ decay, where the ZZ then goes to four leptons, where we don't even count tiles as those leptons, we need <coughs> leptons and muons. Um, we call these the golden channels, which is um, like a very snazzy name. Mm -hmm. uh, it, even though um, combined, they only make up less than half a percent of all the Higgs boson decays. So they're an extremely tiny slice of this pie. But if you look at this uh, plot over here, this is from the Higgs discovery. You can see they're, they're doing a scan of the function of the mass of the proposed peak particle. And you can see on the y-axis here, this is the local p-value. And then on the y, you can see, on the side, you can see um, what that is in terms of the significance of the signal. So the black here is the combined, and you can see it reaches down to five sigma, around 125 GeV. Uh, the green here is from the Higgs to gamma gamma decay channel alone. Um, and the red is from the Higgs to ZZ decay channel alone. Um, and this is only less than half percent of the decays. And this most probable decay corresponds to the cyan line, which is basically just laying here at the top doing nothing. Um, and actually, in the Atlas version of this plot, they didn't even draw anything that wasn't Higgs to gamma gamma and Higgs to Z. So that's a little bit weird. And I'm going to talk about why that is um, and why that doesn't have to be in a minute. So, did you have a question? Okay. Okay. So in order to understand why these decays are the ones that we have historically used, even though they're very rare, we have to talk about the way that the CMS experiment uh, operates. And this is also almost everything I'm going to say is true, also the Atlas experiment. Um, but here you can see like a little diagram of 
uh, what the CMS experiment looks like if you took a big chunk out of the side. So the protons are coming in through this orange tube. This is representing the beam. Uh, then you have this blue detector here that is made of uh, silicon pixels and silicon strips. So this is the most expensive and also the most um, highly data generating portion of the detector. Uh, outside of that, you have this sort of greenish area, which is the electromagnetic calorimeter um, that's meant to measure photons and electrons very precisely. This yellow part then is the hadronic calorimeter, which is meant to measure uh, the energy deposition from hadrons uh, and jets. And then this white part here is the uh, solenoid magnet of CMS. So CMS actually um, stands for compact one solenoid. So this is the S of CMS. And mm -hmm. then uh, the rest of this part out here is the M. This is the muon system, all of this white and red stuff, uh, which will capture the signature from muons, which pump through all the uh, more inner areas of the detector. So this is a picture of what that looks like. Uh, if your eye is the proton and the other proton is coming right out of the center there, um, this is what it looks like out of CMS detector. You can see that the actual parts in the previous uh, diagram were pretty true um, mm -hmm. in real life. And this is what you'll see if you go with open now. Don't book your ticket. Um, but if we then just sort of superimpose a cartoon of what different particle signatures look like, um, you can see here this is what a muon would look like at CMS. So some stuff is happening in the middle that we're not going to look too closely at yet. But we can see that something is coming out and leaving some signature in this outermost system of our detector. Um, this is the muon system. And we can say, aha, that's a muon. So that was like pretty easy to do. Um, if we then zoom in and look at that stuff in the middle, uh, you can see your muon already going out there. Um, all of the lines represent tracks. Uh, you can see here there's an electron with a track associated with some energy deposition. The orange is indicating that it's in the electromagnetic polarimeter. Over here, you see a photon that looks a lot like the electron, but it doesn't have a track associated. Um, and then over here, you see a whole bunch of combinations of signatures that represent a jet. So I'm drawing this mm -hmm. to indicate the hadronic jet. All of the tracks that are color coded red here correspond to stuff that should be included in this jet. Um, so we have signatures of our tracking detector and our electromagnetic calorimeter, which is this orange part, and our hadronic calorimeter, which is this purple part. So it's just a whole bunch of different pieces contributing to this. So um, basically, the Higgs to gamma gamma decay relies on this type of object, which is very simple. Um, the Higgs to ZZ to four lepton decay relies on these two types of objects, electrons and muons, which are also very simple. And uh, hadronic decays of the Higgs, like Higgs to rely on this type of object, which is really difficult to use. So um, why are jets really hard to use? I realize that I'm like preaching to the prior here of why jets are hard. Um, but uh, they're complicated. They're hard to model because you have to do some calculations in a non perturbative game. Um, you have a really big detector signature that is crossing your different detector subsystems. They need to all talk to each other. They need to all be calibrated. Um, and as a result, they're hard to they're hard to measure precisely, which means that you have a low diejet mass resolution, which means that you have a low resolution on your Higgs boson reconstructed mass. So you can see over here, um, this is an example from uh, a Higgs to BB analysis where um, they're actually looking at the BBF channel, but they're not looking at high PT. Uh, you can see the signal simulated here in uh, gluon fusion in this dark red or dark yellow, and then the BBF in the light yellow. And they fitted it with this crystal ball function. So this is kind of what we expect our peak to look at look like. But if you compare to what the peak would look like in uh, photons, electrons, or muons, um, you can compare the uh, width here that's fitted on this crystal ball function, and you can see that the width here is 11 and a half GeV compared to the dipole of the cable, you have one and a half GeV. Electrons where you have 2.4 GeV, and muons where you have 1.14 GeV. So um, you can really see, also keep in mind the difference in the uh, scales on these uh, x axes. These uh, photons, electrons, and muons are giving you much narrower, sharper, better resolution Higgs peaks, which is part of why that signature has been so useful for doing precise measurements compared to Higgs to BZ. Um, the other reason that these hydronic states like Higgs to BZ are, are hard is that jets are everywhere in a proton proton collider. So the total cross section. In the standard model for proton proton to jets is absolutely huge. Uh, you can't save all of those events coming out of CMS. So you have to make some decisions. Um, but even when you make those decisions, you just get huge amounts of data out. And most of it is not what you're looking for. You get quarks and gluons from all, all sorts of different sources. 
um, this is uh, very high rates compared to what you have, for example, for photons. So you can see here, this is the cross section to jets um, in the standard model, and then here you have a cross section to photons and a cross section to a W boson, which is how you could get, for example, an electron or a neuron, and you can see that they're separated by the whole of magnitude. Um, and just for fun, I put the Higgs cross sections on here. The squiggle represents there's a lot of stuff in between. Um, I put the Higgs cross sections on here just so you can compare. Um, these are the types of background that we're dealing with in each of these um, Higgs equations. These are the main signals, but uh, the worst possible case is when we're dealing with a background that has jets. Okay, so um, this is a little bit of the secret of how we can actually make Higgs PD work, which I hope that I can easily really do. Um, but the boosted jet topology is really helpful for us. So as the PT of the Higgs boson increases, the two jets from the decay of the Higgs become more collimated. So here you have an example where the transverse momentum is zero. So this is the rest frame of the Higgs boson. The decay into two bottom quarks is back to back. You end up with two jets, one corresponding to each quark. Um, and they go in opposite directions. Um, as you go to higher PT, uh, you start to get a little bit of a Lorentz boost, and you can see that these are actually separated by an angle that's not 180 degrees. And if you go to high enough PT of about 300 GDP, uh, you can actually draw a single cone corresponding to what we call a large radius jet um, around both of these parts, and you end up with a single jet that has two prongs and two bottom parts uh, contained within it. So the identification and reconstruction of this type of decay um, is a really active area. And this is also just a really powerful way for us to identify Higgs bosons that very conveniently um, is relevant at high PT. Okay, so um, we have a couple of tools that have been developed. I mentioned this is an active area. These are some of the things that we can do in order to make this Higgs UEP decay really pay off for us at high PT. Um, one thing that we can do is what we call grooming. So uh, we can remove extra radiation that is contained in our jet to get a more precise reconstructed Higgs mass. So you can see over here, this is an example of Higgs decay to a uh, BB bar. And you can see that there's always going to be some tracks from particles, either resulting from other protons in the bunch crossing or other pieces of your event that don't actually come from the Higgs boson. If you can identify and remove those, you can reconstruct what actually came from your Higgs boson more precisely. That gives you a more precise narrow mass resolution and a better peak. Um, you can do the same thing with quarks, but we don't really care that much. Um, the second thing that we can do is look for substructure. So these Higgs CDB jets have two prongs, one corresponding to each of the decay products, and the backgrounds usually don't. So this is a diagram of what the quark looks like. It has kind of one prong. Of course, there are so many quarks at the LHC that some of them end up looking like this by chance, um, but we expect actually because of physics, our Higgs look like this. Um, and then the last thing we can do is B tagging. So uh, this takes the DD decay uh, is going to contain long lived B hadrons from the um, chevronization of the two bottom parts, which usually corresponds to some sort of displaced vertex. They're drawn out here in a cartoon. You can see each B part has this little secondary vertex inside of it. Um, and usually the backgrounds that come from quarks and gluons don't have that. Um, again, because we just have so many quarks and gluons, we end up with some by chance, um, but not with those other. Their actual physics properties. So I'll talk a little bit about each of these. Um, but first, I want to say that all in all of these different tools uh, I see in all of my little cartoons, I've drawn tracks. All of these different tools rely on very precise particle tracking detectors, and basically any enhancement in capability or any improvement performance that we can bring to our tracking detector uh, corresponds very directly to an improvement in each of these tools, and therefore to our ability to use Higgs PD to do these types of measurements. I, I won't talk much about that. Um, so yeah, going back to the first tool, um, I said it was jet blooming. So not everything that ends up in this jet is related to the Higgs of K. Um, you get these extra tracks from things like pileups. Um, and we can use a soft drop algorithm to remove soft and wide angle radiation from the jet. Um, this is the mathematical definition of what that means. But basically, you can sort of look at these different tracks and decide which ones you keep and which ones you don't. Uh, and it improves the mass resolution. So over here, you can see an example. This is the, this is the soft drop mass, so the mass of the jet after this algorithm has been applied. Um, and you can see it for a couple of different processes. Um, one is this QCD multi-jet, which we expect to be continuously falling. Um, you can see it for the W boson here in the blue, Z boson in green, and Higgs boson in 
the orange. Um, and you can see that these are actually peaking at kind of the right places for um, the mass of each of these different objects. So this is what we actually will use in our final statistical analysis as a fit variable. Okay, so then the other tool that I mentioned, or the second tool that I mentioned is jet substructure. So we can use this variable M2, which is a ratio of energy uh, correlation functions, um, to identify jets that are consistent with this two-prong hypothesis. Um, this is a nice variable because theorists don't get mad at us because it is infrared and full visit. <laughs> um, and it's also a powerful discriminant. So um, you can see over here, uh, this is this M2 variable for the case of multi jet, so random quark and gluon. You can see that it peaked at kind of high values here. Um, the W boson and the Z boson are again the blue and green. Um, Higgs is the orange and the peak at kind of lower values. Actually, a question for you that I have gotten in the past um, is why is the W and the Z different from the Higgs? Why are all three not like each other? Because you would think they'd be equal to 2.8. Can think about that, but I don't know the answer. <laughs> that one stumped me. Um, um, okay, but once we have this variable, we want to make sure, since I mentioned we're going to do a fit in the, the soft drop mass uh, of our Higgs candidate jet, we want to make sure that doing any kind of selection on this variable does not in any way affect the shape of our mass distribution. So we, we don't want to accidentally select only things with very low substructure that then corresponds to something with an artificial peak of the Higgs mass. So we have this decorrelated, uh, design decorrelated tiger method um, that we apply to make sure that this variable is not correlated with either the PT of the jet or the mass of the jet. So what we do uh, is we actually look in our QCD multi-jet background uh, and we find as a function of the PT and mass of the jet, what the value is on this variable that will reject uh, in our case 75% um, of the QCD multi jet background. Uh, and then we subtract that variable off the raw, vari raw value of the entry variable. So this basically is saying if there's any shape dependence on the jet mass and the PT, you're going to cut it off completely and flatten it out. So then we can say, all right, I'm going to choose some threshold on this variable um, to select my candidate events, and it's not going to have any impact on the mass distribution. Okay. And then the last tool that I mentioned is. Uh, the actual B tagging. So here we use a machine learning algorithm. We call it the B double B B L version two tagger. B L means B versus light quark. Um, we also have a B versus charm quark, and we also have a charm versus light quark version of this. Uh, but mostly, we're interested in for this analysis, uh, discriminating between QCD multi jets, which is mostly light stuff, and uh, bottom quarks. So this uses a convolutional neural network network architecture. Um, and again, we want this to have the property that when we select on this, it does not have any impact on the shape of our jet mass distribution. Um, so the way that this is done is when we take the signal, uh, we don't say, here's some, an example of some Higgs to be decays. Here's an example of QCD. We say, here's an example of a whole bunch of stuff we came to BB at a huge range of masses. So we go from 20 to 200 GeV. So in that way, um, this machine learning algorithm doesn't actually have any information about what the Higgs mass is. So it's impossible for it to learn that, and it's impossible for it to select on that. Um, and you can see over here a little demonstration. Um, this solid black line is representing the smooth QCD probably QCD distribution um, without applying any selection on uh, this machine learning discriminant. And then you can see uh, for a couple of different working points, so 5% uh, QCD passes this black dash line and down here to half a percent QCD passes this uh, pink dotted line. So these all have basically the same shape. Um, so this is doing pretty well at not impacting the shape of our uh, mass distribution. You will say that look, it actually does impact the shape. But again, I've drawn this blue uh, arrow here that shows where the analysis is actually going to be done. So we aren't using this part at all where it might be a little off. So now that I've talked a whole bunch about um, how we do Higgs CDD, um, I want to come back to this plot, which, which is actually a measurement of the differential Higgs boson uh, PT. So here you can see um, the combined measurement of the Higgs boson PT distribution in the black. Um, and then you can see for three different channels uh, what the individual channel measurement is. So the red here is Higgs CDM and gamma. So that has nice little error bars. Um, Higgs is easy. Is the blue, you can see that it has slightly bigger error bars because it has slightly less statistics. 
And then you can actually see that Nixie Me made it onto the plot, uh, but it actually only made it onto the plot in the highest frequency bins so where we can use these booster tools. Um, and it actually is uh, some of the most powerful in these very high frequency bins because you just don't have enough events from these rare decays. So um, the idea is that we can use this as a tool to study prediction, the production of high energy Higgs bosons in ways that we can't use the things that we have relied on for lower PT. Um, and I also want to mention that uh, for other decays of the Higgs boson that result in hadronic final states, you can reuse a lot of the tools that I talked about, um, like the grooming and the substructure. Uh, these all have lower branching fraction than Higgs which is why I'm focusing on Higgs BB. Uh, but you can do it as well in Higgs to Tau Tau. Um, there's a recent boosted Higgs to Tau Tau result that you can find there. Uh, and people are also trying to do it in Higgs to WW uh, with an all hadronic final state. Okay, so yeah, that's going to bring me to actually the analysis that I'm going to focus on. But before that, does anybody have a question? Yeah. Um, sorry, so just to make sure I follow. Um, so in the slide before this, so in your, so you're saying that you are not giving your algorithm any information of what the Higgs mass spectra should look like. So then you're just sort of running it over all different channels and trying to recreate the mass spectra, and then you see that they agree at the high T rate. Is that what is that the logic? Sorry. So what we've done here is we've actually uh, put our QCD simulation through the algorithm, mm -hmm. and we expect to get a smoothly following distribution. Mm -hmm. But if the algorithm was something about where it thought the Higgs mass should be, it would give us kind of a false peak, right? It would say this looks like a Higgs BB decay because it has a mass near the Higgs, and it would give us kind of a faint peak there, even if there was no mix. Okay. Um, and then do you, like, is it understood why um, it performs better at high PT? Is it, like, why you would be, why the ratio, yeah, gets to one? So why the different lines are more similar? Yeah, yeah. Um, not really, and honestly, with an uncertainty, it's probably not really the difference. This might be a little difference. Um, yeah, sorry, I meant, like, why there's a difference on the low. So this this is actually near the edge of the signal trading data set. So you can see okay. it's 20 to 200 GeV. So down here, we're actually um, kind of like near the okay. low mass edge of our training data set, um, which we've actually found that we shouldn't, we shouldn't go too close to the edges there because um, our algorithm starts to get confused when you give it something 15 GeV and it's only been trained it's 20 to 200. You can't really rely on it anymore. This is not below that threshold, but it's getting high close. Yeah. Hi, this is on slide 15. I'm going off of memory here, I think. Um, so the bottom left plot, um, is that for Higgs? Yeah, Higgs for gamma gamma. Why is it at 90? Uh, the peak is at 90 for the mass of the, the gamma gamma. That's a really good question. I really don't know. Look back at that paper. Okay. I noticed that. But, but yeah, it's in the wrong spot. And um, things of that match didn't decay that way. Okay. <laughs> then um, I'll move on to actually talking about this uh, VBF boosted Higgs analysis. So this is just kind of a quick overview, and I'll talk about each of these different pieces in a little bit more detail. Um, but the sort of broad stroke strategy that we apply is that we have some selection that targets these boosted Higgs candidates and rejects backgrounds. Um, once we've done that, we add tailored cuts to target those VBF topology. Um, so that's what I've sort of drawn over here. This is a variable uh, depending on the, uh, this is the digit invariant mass of the two additional quark jets that you had mentioned. I would tell these apart. When we look for these two additional quark jets. We look for them to have high invariant mass. And we look for them to have uh, high angular separation of beta. Uh, so we can carve out a little corner of phase space that's going to be very clear in our VBF process uh, because we've identified these uh, additional jets. And we're going to call everything else that's dominated by gluon fusion because the rate is very high. Um, once we've done that, we're going to divide into a B type passing and a B type failing region using the pattern that I talked about. 
Um, we expect that our actual Higgs events will have high DWB discriminant discriminant scores, um, but we're going to use the region of data with low score uh, to perform a data driven background of the QC background estimate of the QCD. So I'll talk a bit more about that. And then finally, what we do is we fit the soft drop mass distribution of the Higgs candidate in both of these regions, but then using the low HLD tiger score to inform the QCD estimate. And we get out two signal strengths for more fusion and for PDF. So the signal strength that will be our final result is the ratio of the standard to the standard model expected cross section for each of these processes. Okay. So uh, first, the event selection. So this is what we do to just sort of roughly select on our Higgs boson events. Um, we start with events passing at least one trigger that selects for something like HT, which is the sum of the PT of all the jets in the event, um, selects on high jet PT, selects on high jet mass, or selects on some B-tagging variables. Um, in this data set, which corresponds to run two, these B-tagging mm -hmm. variables at the trigger level are quite weak. Uh, don't do a lot, but that is about to change, and I'll talk later on about that. Um, and then we call this a trigger soup, because we basically take the logical OR of all of these different triggers. Um, and this is fully efficient at leading jet PT greater than 500 GB. So what that means is we expect to select all of our signals, all of our Higgs to BB greater than 500 GB using this set of triggers. But that means we don't expect to select it all below that, um, which is a limitation of this analysis. Um, so then we require at least one large radius jet that houses two kind of substructure that we talked about. Um, the PT of that jet we require to be um, greater than equal to 450 GeV. Um, and if we have more than one jet that satisfies this, we choose the one with the highest deep double B tiger score to be the Higgs candidate. Um, then we said we don't want to have any electrons or muons or tau's in this event, and we'd want to have not very much missing energy. Um, this is mostly for the rejection of top part background. So if you have two high energy top parts that are produced, one of them could decay to a B and a W. You have a hadronic decay of that W, it will give you a two pump jet that could fake a Higgs. The other one, meanwhile, um, if it decays uh, to a B and a W that decays leptonically, we'll give you a lepton. We've cut those out with our lepton veto, uh, as well as with our missing <laughs> that has the neutrino from that decay. Um, and then this last piece is we require no B jet in the hemisphere opposite the candidate jet. It's again aimed at this top part background. If you have one top going in this direction, the paint would be in a W. Um, you're going to have another B from the second top going in the other direction. If you say, if I see that I throw it away, then you get rid of the second. Pretty effectively, actually. You can still have new ones inside. Yes. So I should say a V2 on isolated leptons. Um, and then the final thing that we asked is does the event have at least two more thin jets in addition to the Higgs candidate? And do they have this high angular separation and this high barrier mass? Um, if all of these things are true, we do have these jets, they do have these properties, then we put this into the VBF category. Otherwise, either because it doesn't have these two extra jets or because it does have these two extra jets and if they don't satisfy these properties, then it goes into the low fusion category. Um, so here is a picture of what uh, a candidate VBF event actually looks like in data. Paul was telling you about this earlier. Um, so you can see here this. Uh, yellow cone is representing your Higgs candidate jet. You can see very clearly um, this is the energy deposition in the electromagnetic polymer in green, and then in the hadronic polymer in blue. And you can see the two prongs very distinctly here. Um, and you can also see that there's a muon corresponding to each of these prongs. And this muon is actually one of the ways that your long leaf B hadron can decay. So that's actually indicating that each of these prongs corresponds uh, to something that was initiated by a bottom quark. So that's pretty cool. Um, I think what makes this very VBF-y is you have these two jets that are going uh, nearly parallel to the beam that correspond to your forward quarks. So your extra two quarks in this event, they have a large separation in beta angle, and they have a large invariant mass. Just a very nice. It's not by 200 MeV. 200 MeV? 200 MeV, yeah. You gotta work on that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I could fix 200 MeV. Okay, so I've talked about all of this selection. So now we can look at how okay. our simulated signal events actually fall into these different categories. Um, I put here a lot of details about the way that we do this theory prediction, but I think that this crowd doesn't necessarily care about that. Um, so I'll just say that we've simulated with this power generator 
all of our different Higgs processes. Uh, and in general, they agree very well with the recommendations from the other stages cross section of the group. Um, so you can see over here for the two different categories that I talked about. On the top is the DBF category. Um, the deep double will be passing is what we should really focus on. This is the one where the Higgs candidate get really looks like um, two prong VJET. And the green here is representing the simulated BBF sample. So you can see that there's some little infusion that actually does make it in, passing our selection, but it is mostly vector both infusions. It's mostly green here. Things are a little bit complicated for the gluon fusion um, because you have all of these extra production modes that I said were small. Um, they still contribute, and you do have a little bit of uh, BBF still sneaking into your gluon fusion category, but it is dominated by more than half gluon fusion. Um, and one thing that's interesting about this analysis is that the theory uncertainties on these uh, production cross sections are actually larger than the experimental uncertainties. So this is also a very active area right now. Here, so working on improving these calculations, especially at IPT, all the time. Um, but for now, these theory uncertainties are about twenty percent on real fusion and five percent on BBF. Okay. Um, so then I'll I'll give a short overview of the background estimation. But um, on this example data plot, I just wanted to show you what the different pieces look like. So we have a non-resonant background from QCB jets, which is uh, corresponding to this white histogram, the smooth following distribution. Um, we have a resonant v post jets background. So uh, does anybody want to guess what the blue peak corresponds to? Written there. It's it's easy. Easy. <laughs> uh, so this is boosted Z to BB. So it's selected by our tagger because it has the right substructure and it has the right flavor properties. Um, so we expect it to be there. Um, and see that it shows up nice and strongly over top of our QCD um, and at the right mass. Uh, and we use that later on. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, and then we also have some background containing top marks. Uh, these are in the pink and the purple, which you can see you can barely see. Um, but we do uh, derive their normalizations from a data control region, even though they're only something like 1% uh, of the background. And then on top of these three processes, everything else accounts for less than 1% of the background. That's stuff like diboson production and what I call background Higgs, which is that uh, VH and TTH production. So the Higgs production modes that are very low cross section that I'm not considering here. I just pretend that they occur at standard model rates. Okay, so in addition to the selection, we also divide our analysis up into a bunch of differential bins. Uh, one advantage of this is that if you divide into these differential bins and they have different signal to background ratio, statistically you're going to end up with uh, better uh, sensitivity, assuming that your systematics are under control. Um, so for the gluon fusion category, we have six bins in the PT of the Higgs candidate. So I posted this here, and then you can see over here um, the data plot corresponding to uh, each of these bins. So these two on the top are the lowest PT bins, these two on the bottom are the highest PT bins, and you can see that this peak from ZHBB, as well as actually um, starting to include some uh, W plus jets, is showing up very, very strongly over the QCD, especially at high fatigue here. For the VBF category, we decided uh, not to bin in the PT of the Higgs candidate, but to bin in the invariant mass of the two forward jets. There's another common variable that we used here. Um, and you can see those two plots here. We have um, one bin that's one to two TEV in that mass, and one that's two TEV and above. Okay, so for the QCD background estimation, I won't talk much about it, but I will give you this sort of cartoon. Um, the goal is that we want to use the data that has low deep double B tagger score to predict the uh, distribution of QCD in the region that has high deep double B tagger score. So uh, we start with this data and we apply two transfer factors, which are essentially um, corrections that depend on the jet mass and the jet PT. So um, yeah, we have we have one up here. Uh, I don't know if I can get this one up here um, is derived completely on Monte Carlo. Uh, this is where we actually just say I have sim simulated PCD. What does the shape of it look like failing my tiger score? What does the shape look like passing? Do they look the same? If not, what is the polynomial that gives me the relationship between them? Um, the good news is I talked about how we tried very hard with the training of our tagger to make sure that. Uh, this would not be something that was needed. And actually in all of the cases, um, we found that this was very flat. So uh, this is something that we kept in as a precaution, uh, but we found that our uh, tagger, uh, careful tagger training was actually making sure that this 
um, this was not really needed. The other one here, um, when you have uh, data in Monte Carlo, you don't always understand um, exactly the relationship between them when it comes to PCD. So we have an additional correction factor here um, that's just taking into account any differences between the failing and the passing region. Uh, and you can see over here, our final prediction is uh, some central value, some uncertainty that comes with each of these polynomials. And then we have the zero signal on top. Um, for the W and Z background, um, we tried very hard to get uh, the predictions for these, especially the cross section, uh, correct to the best possible order that's available uh, in terms of the theory prediction. So you can see over here, um, I've taken um, a plot from the theory paper that we use to make sure that uh, all of these are as accurate as possible. Um, our simulation actually corresponds to um, the PT distribution shown here in blue. So our simulation is leading order. But we apply some corrections that actually take us to um, the next leading order PT spectrum. So we go from the blue to the green. And then for the overall cross section, not the PT state, but the overall cross section, we apply an additional correction that takes us to the red. So um, we've done our best to be uh, as on top of things as possible there. Um, and then I mentioned that we have this prominent ZTBB peak that passes our tagger selection. Um, we use this to derive. The efficiency of that tagger in situ. So we say we've seen ZWB a bunch of times. We believe that that's standard model. Um, what is the efficiency of my tagger, assuming that that's standard model? Um, and this actually turns out to be the dominant experimental systematic uncertainty. Um, but it's very nice that we have this sort of standard candle in our analysis um, that we can use to calibrate this tagger. Um, we also have a couple of corrections that we apply to this resonant background. Um, that correspond to the efficiency of the um, jet substructure selection, um, the jet mass scale, and jet mass, or mass, mass resolution, which is basically saying, is our peak at the same uh, mass as in our data and our simulation? And does our peak have the same width in our data and our simulation? If not, we need to correct to make sure that everything matches the data. So this is how we do that. Um, we want to make sure that our peak is in the right place, that it has the right width, and um, that our substructure selection efficiency, which corresponds to the overall normalization of this peak, um, is correct. So we do this in a control region. So basically, we take exactly the same selection as in our signal region, but we change one thing so that it is as similar as possible. Um, so that thing that we change is we say we need one muon, and we need that muon to make sort of a fake W candidate by combining it with um, some missing energy, and we need that KW to have at least two energy easy and PT. So the goal here is that we're selecting a sample of top park events, um, where one of the top parts is decaying semi-atomically, that's how we get the new one, and the other top park is decaying hadronically, and we end up with a hadronic W boson decay, and then that hadronic W boson is the peak that we use to actually measure each of these things. So this is completely orthogonal to our signal region, um, we can fit all of these parameters and understand exactly how they're related in simulation of data. Uh, and we can also include the uncertainties that we get from doing this fit um, in our final analysis of the systematic. Okay, so that was the boring part. Now I get to the results. Um, so here you can see in the BWB passing region. On the left here, this is the gluon fusion category. And on the right here, this is the BBF category. Um, you can see the QCB background is smoothly following. Uh, people always ask me about this discontinuity. This is because this plot is showing you summed over all of the different PT bins, um, but the PT and mass uh, bins are slightly different. Uh, sorry, the mass bins are slightly different in each of the PT categories because we don't want to be in a region of phase space where um, our jet cone isn't encompassing everything. So for lower PT, we have to limit our mass range. So this discontinuity is just because you're, you're adding things that were for different mass ranges. Um, and then over here, you can see the BBF category, and you can see the Z to BB peak showing up very nicely. Um, and you can see the signal here. The uh, red dotted line is showing the blood fusion signal. The green line is showing you the BBF signal. So you can see here, this is the data minus background over the data uncertainty. Um, you can see how your signals are showing up, and it's showing up quite strongly in the BBF category. Okay. So quantitatively, what does this correspond to? Um, we can calculate a significance for each of these processes separately for vector boson fusion and gluon fusion with the other process freely floating. So we end up with uh, three sigma for VBF compared to 0.9 expected. 
1.2 sigma for balloon fusion, 2.4 nanometers per fib. And then here we have the signal strength um, shown separately in each of the different data taking periods that we consider. And then uh, the most interesting row is the one down here on the bottom. So again, the signal strength, which we did not view, is the measured cross-section of this process over the expectation for the standard model. So you can see for the total combined row two luminosity, we end up with a signal strength for VBF that's five times the standard model expectation with a large uncertainty. So plus 2.1 minus 1.8. And then for blue infusion, we end up with something that is 2.1 times the standard model expectation, plus 1.9 and minus 1.7. So the fully correct way to think about this is to actually look at the two-dimensional uh, negative log likelihood distribution, which you can see here in this color scale. So the signal strength for blue infusion is on the x-axis here. Uh, the standard model corresponds to this red star. So that's um, the fusion signal strength of one. The vector boson fusion signal strength is here um, on the y-axis. Standard model again corresponds to one. And then the best fit is given by this plus with the 68% confidence contour <coughs> on the solid and the 95% confidence contour on the dashed. And you can see that uh, the standard model is actually outside of the 95% confidence contour uh, for this best fit. And this is actually a discrepancy of 2.6 sigma. Um, we can also talk about how uh, our best fit differs from the hypothesis of the Higgs boson not existing. It's not something that we really believe anymore, um, but it's nice to quantify sometimes. So that corresponds to zero, zero on this plot, and that's a discrepancy of 3.9 sigma. Uh, and then over here, you can just see for each of the PT bins in the blood fusion category, and for each of the VB, uh, VBF uh, bins in this digit invariant mass, um, what the signal strength is if you look individually in each of those categories um, compared to the combined, which is shown in the blue. Um, and basically what I wanted to demonstrate here is that for vector boson fusion, uh, we're fitting something above the standard model in both of these differential bins. Uh, it's not isolated to one or the other. Okay, so um, I will only spend my last couple of minutes talking about what's next. So um, this analysis that we talked about uh, has been on the run two data set from the LHC. So that corresponds to what we took between 2015 and 2018. Um, we still have a bunch of data that we haven't done, you know, every possible analysis with. So um, I have a couple of thoughts on how we can probe this particular physics further in that data set. Um, we're also still collecting data now in run three, and we've made some important changes to uh, particularly our trigger system. So I'll talk a little bit about what we can do with that. And then um, I'll just end with the HLLHC, which is uh, the long-term upgrade to the uh, accelerator complex that corresponds to also to detector upgrades for LS and CMS. And this is data that we're preparing for and machines that we're building now. Um, and how, how is this going to actually um, propel us forward? So um, when it comes to the run two data set, uh, the thing that I would like to do next is uh, study this VH Higgs to BB process. So this is one of the diagrams I told you I wasn't thinking about. This is the third highest cross section this is the blue line on this plot that you can see is actually increasing in fractional contribution as a function of Higgs PT. So this is actually very interesting because this process becomes more important at PT, whereas blue infusion becomes less important and VBS is pretty stable. Um, but the thing that's interesting here is um, I told you how I was color coding these vertices. So this is the interaction here between a W or a Z and a Higgs boson. This is the exact same vertex that's probed by this VBF production. Um, and so if what we have seen in our um, VBF search, which is an excess in the VBF channel, if that corresponds to some sort of enhancement in this coupling at high PT, this channel would, would be sensitive to the same thing. So that's just additional uh, motivation for looking for something like this. Uh, we, you know, if it were new physics producing the result we just saw, we would expect it to see something here. Okay, and then looking a little bit further forward into run three. Um, I talked about the trigger soup that we're using, so we plan to continue using the trigger soup, um, but we have some actually really exciting new things that we can include in that soup. Um, one thing is the possibility to lower the thresholds on things like jet PT and HT. Um, so I mentioned that we have full efficiency, so we select all of our Higgs CDB signal um, above 500 GeV, but there's actually boosted Higgs events much lower than that. So if we can lower these thresholds, we can actually have higher statistics and maybe do more precise measurements. Um, although that's maybe not so interesting for new physics going to lower PT. Um, for this uh, VH measurement that I just mentioned, 
we can actually try and reuse some of the triggers that are designed for dye Higgs production. But people are very interested in studying the Higgs self-coupling by looking for two Higgs bosons produced in the same event. They've designed a whole bunch of triggers related to this, looking for two high mass jets, things like that. And for BH, we can very easily uh, repurpose those. Um, and then one of the things that I'm the most excited about is all boosted Higgs BB channels, regardless of production mode, are going to benefit from B tagging in the high level trigger. So I mentioned that we had some triggers based on B tag properties that were kind of weak. Um, that's not true anymore. So here you can see as a function of the leading jet PT, um, how the B tag trigger is actually selecting large radius jets. And just from this trigger alone, above about 400 GeV, you get 80% of your events are selected by this trigger. So this is something that I think could actually uh, really increase our statistics um, and our precision uh, on this measurement. And then finally, there's something very weird that CNS does, I think more than Atlas, um, called data parking, where uh, the idea is that we take the data now, but we don't actually look at it. We don't actually throw it through the rest of our processing system until we're finished um, run free. So we would collect this data, we would save it, we wouldn't process it, we would process it during the next shutdown because we have so much other stuff that we need to process in the meantime. Um, and there's actually a dedicated stream here for vector boson fusion and for dye hits. So uh, this is not something that we'll get our hands on immediately, but this is something that will be a high statistics data set for both VBF and VH. Uh, so this could be really interesting. And then finally, at the high luminosity LHC, we're expecting a factor of uh, about 10 more data. So uh, that corresponds to 100 times the data that we had at the age of recovery. And um, that's a lot. <laughs> um, that comes with a challenge. Uh, which is that we're having a lot more simultaneous proton proton interactions than we've had before. Um, and as a result, we are upgrading all of our detectors and our trigger system. Uh, and a couple of these upgrades are really going to have um, very specific uh, advantages for the Higgs BB final state, particularly the silicon trackers that I mentioned that are going to be fully replaced and their range is actually going to be extended. Um, so this is going to be really great for substructure and e-tagging. We're going to be able to measure those things more precisely and get more mileage out of all of those boosted jet tools that rely on tracks. Okay, so that brings me to the summary. These are all of the things that I said. Um, we've done a first search for VBF in this high PC channel. Um, we have a deviation from the standard model expectation of about 2.6 sigma, uh, but we are not done yet. And there's a lot promising uh, future directions. We have a bit of time for questions for Jenna. Uh, there were some during the talk, but if there are any, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, thanks again for the great talk. Um, I just have a pretty general question, and it's actually in the earlier part of the the, the chat, like slide seven. But I think in slide thirty one, you showed the same. I guess where you have the no thirty one is something. I'm sorry. No. Uh, so basically, where you where you're showing the different production mechanisms at different uh, root s. Values and then on the side you show the actual the PT at a specific root so 13 T. This guy. Yes, exactly. So I'm curious here as to what the plot on the right looks like at the lower center of mass energy. So let's say it's 17 B. Do they do they have the same sort of uh, you know qualitative I guess production mechanism uh, I guess roughly. distributions? Or, yeah. I would say roughly. Yeah. Um, so one thing that you can see is that this, this TPH is using differently right. because when you have three heavy objects, you have a higher center of mass energy, that becomes a bit easier. So this one, I, I would expect to be less important at the lower center of mass energy, but otherwise I would say similar. And I guess also like getting a little bit more sort of like fringe in this leftmost plot, like assuming that, you know, we don't have any limiting factors as to how high we can go in our center of mass energies, at what point would these curves all sort of just flatten out? Um, B ones? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or would they is also a, like a good question. For the total cross section, I don't think would necessarily flatten out. I mean, I don't know. This is what I'm asking, right? So that's like my question is like, would they flatten out? Would you expect them to flatten out? If not, then why? Well, I would say in general, the more energy you have, it's easier to produce something heavy. Right? 
which is what we're doing. Sure. And I wouldn't expect that to saturate. Why not? Because you have more energy and it's easy to make something heavy. If you have more energy and it's easy to make something heavy, that never stops being true. There's an energy threshold. Yeah, but I would assume that at some point you stop sort of producing additional relative to, say, a lower energy provision, right? So I think given all the choices of things you could make, heavier stuff becomes more likely as you go to higher center mass energy. Even light stuff gets more. The total gluon cross section probably keeps in stuff. That's actually true. The, um, if you've got a higher center of mass energy, your proton becomes more just like a whole bunch of gluons, um, which makes it easier to do these gluon initiated. I mean, yeah, this is a good, but I think at some point you reach a saturation level, no? I don't know, but I don't think so. I mean, it's just something I was thinking about. And then I guess like what I wanted to ask about slide 31 was, uh, is this this is the XKCD Python package you're using for plotting these things? I didn't make that. No, you, have to, you have to ask on my class. Good question. Yeah, I was going to ask about the die fixture using for the VH uh, production mode. Is that I is the CH over W? It depends on how it's implemented. Okay. Um, the ones that I know about are just looking for two things that are high mass. Okay. Um, so in that case, no. Uh, if they include flavor, because I think you're you're getting at um, there has recently been in CMS uh, dye Higgs boosted Higgs boson each going to Higgs to BD. So basically, two jets of the type that I just described that has turned out to be actually uh, I would say it surprised a lot of people how strong that actually was in terms of its um, constraint on the Higgs self coupling. Well, not the Higgs self coupling, but some of the couplings that they measure these dye dye Higgs final states. So if they target that specific final state with some sort of flavor selection, then yes, I would say it will do that. Um, but as far as I know, so far they're just based on that. So you, okay. So you said that you were gonna use the Zs to check your tagging efficiency. And when you did that, did it come out right? Was your scale factor wrong? Our scale factor was not wrong. Um, we know that our tag efficiency is less than one. We can measure that in independent data sets, um, but they're never exactly the same phase space as our analysis. Um, but it did come out fairly close to what we expected based on those remote control regions. But it was not one, it was something like 0 0.8, 0 0.8, 0 0.5. So, but let, let's just be clear that means that, that you're tagging. As predicted by Monte Carlo, was often dated by fifteen percent, and there was a lot of uncertainty on that. The dominant systematic. I should have mentioned at some point that we have all these systematics, but none of them really matter on top of the statistical uncertainty, because this is a very rare process. Okay. If there are no questions, then let's continue.